Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and this podcast is all about Imagine Wealth Without Risk. And we're going to talk, as, as always, about building wealth. And we, I like to talk about tax liens and tax defaulted property and how to make money. There's a lot more to making money than just going out and doing the actual money making. So it takes a lot of people to run a company. And I'm very fortunate today to have a guest that's a chief financial officer and has helped the company grow to, as we're probably going to find out, to hundreds of people in many different states. And so this is the kind of information that you want on a podcast. And sure, you're driving along there in your car. So just open up your brain and let's let a lot of new information fall in and And I'll ask a lot of questions. Some will be easy, some will be hard, but you'll see how someone that's a financial person answers questions. And that's what you have to become if you're going to be in business. You've got to learn about finance. You've got to learn about marketing. You've got to, there's a lot to learn. So I can teach you about tax liens and deeds and that kind of thing, but I can't teach you about how to build a company, uh, certainly as well as some of these other people. Mr. Whalen is with me today, and his first name is Keminer. And hopefully, I, hopefully I've said it. Kevin, let's, uh, t- let's start off by, first of all, can you hear me okay? I've got you, Ted, and you did a great job with the first name. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Whalen. <laughs> so anyway, so l- let's have some fun on this, this podcast because you're an expert, but tell people about your expertise and how you made a, helped a company grow and where you see the future and things like that. So we have, we have plenty of time. Let's take 20 or 30 minutes and let's educate people. My people are people that I usually range in age from about 40 years old. I like to joke around and say 45 to 105. They're adult <laughs> people and they've worked for other companies and they've worked for themselves. Building a company is a special, really a special thing. And not everybody can do it. And entrepreneurs are especially bad about the building part. They're very good about making money, but I don't know about the building part. So can you tell us, first of all, a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I taught my teeth in real estate and real estate finance. I, I work for banking for a number of years. And in the underwriting world, I worked on a hundred plus million dollar portfolio, 95% of which was real estate secured. That's really where I cut my teeth. And admittedly, as a CFO, that's, that's what I bring to the table is a more data driven approach, an understanding of the regulatory environment and the nuances in order to be able to navigate to help grow the company. It, it, it's easy to talk about growth it's much harder to be able to execute on that. So a huge part of my role here at BlackRock Construction is the marriage of that growth mindset where everything works and you gotta go and acquire and acquire and buy, where you balance that with the data. What is the investment performance? What do the numbers look like? What is the anticipated outcome? How is this going to positively impact our company and allow us to continue on the growth trajectory. We started off as a company really just seven short years ago. And the first six months was a lot of ramp up of adding people who were the most critical folks to have on the team. We identified certainly the need to have the financial expert. That's where I came into play. We do a fair amount of permitting and development work. So we needed an individual there. It was about growing our team on the front end to be able to deliver the growth needed and grow the company to support taking on more staff while also being able to take on the projects to satisfy the staffing. So it's a delicate balance of how do you identify the opportunity and then who do you bring on to be able to effectuate that. And in our short seven years, we've been able to really drive that growth. We were ranked in 2017 as the number 42 fastest growing company on the Inc. 5000, uh, which was number one in the U.S. at the time uh, in construction and development. So we've certainly been able to apply the model and the data-driven approach coupled to that growth-minded mindset to be able to deliver a fast-growing company while also making sure we're, we're taking the appropriate steps to not grow too fast. Now, Kevin, let me interrupt you for just a second. Um, sure. You told us about a company. Tell us just a little bit about you. You, you got 16 kids. You live in a small house. You <laughs> drive race cars on weekends. Uh, t- tell me a little bit about you so people can relate to you a little bit, okay? Sure, absolutely. I do live in Vermont. We have a, an absolutely gorgeous state, so I spend a fair amount of my time outdoors. 
I uh, live very close to Lake Champlain, so I get out of my kayak and do uh, all sorts of fishing out on the kayak, including with the fly rod. Uh, I have a lovely wife, uh, 10 years actually coming up at the end of this month. Congratulations. Uh, I have a daughter who's in third grade and a son who is two and a half, and he's a handful. <laughs> Ooh, wow, I'll bet. That's a, all right, so you're having a little fun with the family and uh, Lake Champlain. Tell people a little bit about that. I know about it because I grew up in New England, but uh, isn't that a beautiful place? Lake Champlain is an absolutely gorgeous lake. It's nestled between the Green Mountains and the Adirondacks. On the Vermont side of things, you have stunning sunset views overlooking the lake and the Adirondacks. It was actually at one point briefly considered to be one of the Great Lakes. It helped us secure some funding to build out a, a nice facility on the lake, a little museum, an aquarium type thing that the public gets to go to. Lake Champlain is really unmatched in, in its beauty. In Vermont overall, we have a quality of life. That, How big that, is it? I, I know it's big. How big is it? So the, the lake runs the entirety of the length of uh, the state of Vermont. And actually, it's one of the few lakes, and we're really getting to the nitty-gritty details of Lake Champlain, it runs north. So you can actually go all the way from New York City, you hop into the Hudson, you go through some locks into Lake Champlain, and then you take more locks once you get north into Canada, and you can get out into the St. Lawrence Seaway out into the Atlantic. So it's, it's quite a body of water with a Is lot that of maybe 200, 200 miles, maybe? How long would that be? Yeah, something like that, absolutely. Oh, yep. God. And fishing and all that? Fishing is amazing. We've got uh, great landlocked Atlantic salmon, uh, certainly good largemouth and excellent smallmouth bass fishing, and then your standard sort of panfish type stuff. But it, it, it's a very popular lake uh, that attracts many people. Uh, Vermont is actually fairly sparsely populated with the exception of the county that we operate in. For the most part, there's only 650,000 people or so. We have more tourists that come to Vermont largely because of the lake uh, than we do have a overall population. Yeah. Now, do you require a passport if they come from New York? No, no passport. They can just come into the state. You just let them come as long as they bring money. right? That's, that's right. Got to get those tourism dollars. OK, I got it. OK, go back to this BlackRock uh, construction now. So you're in a small state, but th this is not a small company. We are in a small state, but it's not a small company. And the reason why we're able to do that, and this is an underlying theme of how we've been able to grow. Our underlying market metrics, and this is the nerdy CFO in me coming out here, the underlying market metrics are very favorable. So we have below national average vacancy rates. We have above national average residential rental rates. We have below national average occupancy or uh, vacancy across all property. We have a high barrier to entry market. We have some state-level land use laws that are different than many other states uh, that serves as a highly restrictive barrier to entry, which has adverse impact, but it does have positive impacts in terms of drivers. So it pushes up the price points on our single-family inventory. It pushes up the price points on rental, residential rental, largely because we're not able to bring inventory to the market the way other states do. So we've been able to take advantage of the opportunities in our market. And admittedly, because it's a smaller market, there's fewer competitors. So we've been able to take more market share because of our growth minded approach and fairly aggressive willingness to take on certain projects. We've been able to, in a very quick period of time, position ourselves with some of the largest groups who are doing this generationally. Our biggest competitors are folks who've they, they inherited hundreds and hundreds of acres of farmland that have now become central parts of our, our community generationally. It, it's funny, one of the largest competitors we deal with, their great grandfather sold the land for the interstate. So it, it, we did not have the same opportunities, but because of our growth minded approach, because of our understanding of the balance of, of this is an interesting concept that I like to talk about being rich versus being wealthy because of our view of saying, Hey, we got to take a look at being wealthy. We've been able to position ourselves very well within our local market, which as odd as it is for a small little state, we're beginning to attract institutional capital. So we've worked with REITs, real estate investment trusts, which are large publicly traded, real estate groups. 
We've worked with private equity firms who fall similarly into that real estate investment trust, but they have a little bit less regulatory restriction. So there's institutional groups who are recognizing the underlying market metrics in our core area of Vermont. And that's how we've been able to accelerate our growth is working with these larger groups. We had a liquidation uh, a couple of years ago in the senior care space in the $11.5 million range. That's a very large transaction in our market. The reason why we're able to do that is we're willing to forge the relationships on a national level. Kevin, let me interrupt you and ask you, what is this BlackRock construction? What, what do you build? So we are a construction manager for both residential and commercial, and we're a development firm. Oh, so okay. we'll take land that's raw land. It's just a field. We'll secure the permits to be able to build either single-family homes, uh, attached units, so townhomes, duplexes, that type of thing, certainly apartment buildings and mixed-use properties. There's margin created because of the barriers to entry between going from it's raw, you can't build houses on it, to you could build houses on it. So now we're picking up margin going from raw to permitted. And because we're a construction management firm as well, we pick up margin in building it out. So we have a vertical integration on the land use and construction side. And where that marries into the much larger organization, you referenced earlier on being in several states and, and hundreds of people, BlackRock Construction is part of a larger group of companies, Adam Hergenrother companies, where they have real estate teams in, I think it's 22 different states right now, uh, several hundred agents and W-2 staff. He's got a training organization that helps folks to understand not only what it means to be a realtor, but also what it means to be a real estate investor and how to go about improving the decision-making process you're making. So there's these groups that collectively come together that hit upon all of the critical components associated with building and buying a house. So in the 22 different states, there are opportunities that come to us to evaluate, hey, is this a good opportunity? And a lot of what we do when we take a look at those other states, and part of my role with these other organizations outside of BlackRock that are this affiliate group underneath the Adam Hergenrother Company's umbrella is help them identify where it's appropriate to go. And a lot of that is driven by the underlying market metrics. Real estate investment in the truest sense. So there's a million ways to invest in real estate. Certainly the tax stuff that you're the expert in, there's the re-opportunity, which are publicly traded. You could make an investment in a read on a stock exchange. A lot of what we do is direct acquisition. And then most importantly, we do bring on true passive real estate investors. And this right. is where the, the true CFO nerd is going to come out. The regulation that we rely upon to make these offerings is Reg D, Rule 506B, oh, which sure. was... Let me bring you back. I want to bring you back sure. to... You, you talked about a very important thing. Not that to break, everybody's going to tune out if we talk about regulation. What I do want to talk Fair. about, what you brought up was a very important point, and I, I should have interrupted you then because it's so important. Talk yep. about, if you will, you brought it up like it was important, but then you got buy it, and, and I want to go back to it. And that is, you, you have a scarcity in your market. There's not enough of everything. You're able to get high rents and whatever because there's not too many competitors, right? Can you, mm -hmm. can you just uh, verbalize, uh, opinionize a, a little bit on that? Sure. So the lack of competitive environment is partially driven by the fact that we're a smaller state, so we tend to get a little bit ignored, but it's also driven by the high barrier to entry. Without getting into the whole regulatory side, it's Act 250 is the state-level land use authority that makes it very difficult to bring inventory to the market. And this ties to basic supply and demand. And the underlying market metrics are going to identify for you what those opportunities within the supply and demand is very basic, right? Yeah, so the yeah. lower the supply and the higher the demand, the price points are going to go up. So we operate in a market where there's a lack of inventory. It's difficult to bring that inventory to market. We lack competitors for a couple of reasons. 
a large part of that is actually tied to how difficult it is to do what we do in our state. And that's why the margins are so favorable. That's why we're able to drive those revenues oh, yeah. so high locally. Yeah. Right. Is we have a challenging market to do our business in, which actually drives out a lot of those groups, the Toll Brothers, the Lennar Brothers, that wow. are massive home builders. We don't necessarily have to compete with them because they don't come to our market because it's so difficult, which so creates a huge opportunity for us. To interrupt you there, so you have to be a pretty patient investment investor if you want to build wealth, and you have to be pretty mm -hmm. patient with the way you run this company. Absolutely. And, and that's, I think you're actually nailing the head a little bit on my views of being rich versus being wealthy. Rich, you can get there fairly quickly. And all it is, is a, a check in your bank account. And you're going to go ahead and spend it on lifestyle. Wealth is that personal balance sheet. So within our market, we're able to focus on those wealth builders, those wealth drivers that retained asset, meaning I'm owning this building. I may not be getting the cash flow, but I'm paying down, well, my tenants are paying down X amount per month in mm -hmm. principal balance. That's where that wealth is coming into play. And working with us, our investors, it's truly passive. There's no work being done to benefit from that investment. So time is the most critical component when you're looking at how to build wealth. You can get yeah. rich fairly quickly. Yeah. It takes time to get wealthy. And that's the, the critical outcome because, of course, we're measuring these things on an annualized basis. So I do my underlying math to determine the performance of an anticipated project, a potential project, getting my total return and then saying, all right, how many years is this going to take? And so we're targeting returns in the 15 to 25 percent annualized range. Doesn't mean in year one or year two you're getting that 15 or 20 percent. I usually run these on a 10 year time frame. That means by the end of the 10 years, depending on the strategies, you've paid down a tremendous amount on your personal balance sheet. So you've increased your net worth, which to me is the best measurement of your personal wealth. Now let's go back and uh, let's go back and uh, discuss this a little bit because this is really important for mm -hmm. people. And everybody says hey, you the old game of buying a, a property, fixing it up, and then renting it out. And and if you know it at all, it's a pretty pretty tough business for a lot of people. You're, you're being, it's a lot of work. Way further than that, you're trying to you're trying to buy property and, and do things maybe five or seven years out. That's a guess on my part. And you're, you're building for the future. You're not worried so much about today. Is that pretty much your investment philosophy? Or well, we definitely worry about today. But the way I look at it is, is an investment in and of itself. You're not making the investment for today. You're investing right. those dollars to produce a higher outcome tomorrow. So right. we could look at doing deals where it's a whole bunch of flips and that type of stuff. And yeah, there's some margin there, but ultimately you run into a lot of issues with taxes. It's a fair amount of work to actually have to do it. And then you also run into the unforeseen conditions type stuff. You tear down right. this wall and all of a sudden you see an electrical panel that shouldn't be the way it is. You just right. had an unforeseen or unexpected cost increase. So our focus is not just on what can I make this dollar turn into tomorrow? It's can I turn this dollar into $10 two weeks from now? So I'd rather wait the two weeks to turn my dollar into 10 than have it turn into a dollar 10 tomorrow. And pretty, that's the strategy we you're apply. Pretty patient. You're pretty patient. And that it, it, it truly depends on the profile. And here's the advantage with what we offer. There's truly what I view as two different types of real estate investment class. One is going to produce cash for you, what I would put into the liquidation category. The other is going to produce that net worth. So we have investors, and I sit and I have the conversation. What are your goals? What are your outcomes? What are the results you're targeting? Because that discussion is actually going to lead them to better understand what they're actually looking for, and it's going to help me to match them to the appropriate investment types for their goals. So if their goal is to turn their current cash into the largest amount of cash possible, we look at investments like a subdivision. So a 40 unit subdivision, every time we sell a house, there's a check that comes in from that house. You sell 40 houses over and over again, that's 40 different checks. Those right. are liquidation 
projects. They result in cash outcomes because it depends on the sale, right? right. So for some investors who are looking for that quicker, quicker cash turnover, admittedly those tend to be folks who may not have the huge amount of cash flow income from their work or other investments. Those are folks potentially a little bit younger who are willing to be more aggressive, who aren't necessarily as concerned about the tax impacts from getting all of these checks. Those are great investment opportunities for those cash investors. I'm looking for cash flow. The other investment style is that multifamily apartment building, especially when you use financing from a bank. You're reducing your cash flow, but you have a whole lot of balance sheet value. You're increasing your net worth. And the best part about an increase in net worth is it's not taxable, generally speaking. So you don't have the tax issues that you would in a cash style investment. So let's talk a little bit about some of the big projects and small projects you do. And tell us about the management of it. And if you can relate to uh, a client that uh, would listen to my podcast, and that would be a client that they want, they're trying to buy these properties at uh, 30 cents and 40 cents and sometimes yep. even less on the dollar. And then they want to mm -hmm. turn them. But you can't just go on turning and turning because you're turning and burning, really. The cash comes in, you're wealthy and pay taxes. But talk about how, how you handle that kind of thing. Because a construction project, that requires a lot of cash, and you have to really pay attention to the flow of it, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So our business does require a fair amount of upfront capital, especially in the permitting world. So, again, as a finance guy, my, I love to use the bank to pay for everything. Right, right now, bank money is cheap. Using bank money is a great way to do it. But we do require cash on the front end. Permitting engineering, legal, all of these things require cash. What we do internally is we balance what we want to bring on from investors on the front end because there's a risk profile associated with securing permits in our state. There's huge margins, but there's also risk. So we offer investments that produce higher anticipated performance results when we're bringing on front end at risk cash. When the construction starts, the risk associated with the permits is reduced. Now there's construction risk, but it's our risk. We're taking on the financing. We're providing the personal guarantees to the bank. Our investors do not have any sort of personal guarantee. They don't have that same risk. So we're bringing that financing into play. A great example is the office building I'm, I'm doing this podcast from. It's about a $6 million office building. We brought in only $150,000 in investment capital, gave up a small portion of the overall ownership of the, the, the real estate, not the operating companies, and we used an SBA 504 loan, a government-backed loan. So we were able to get very favorable loan to values, which reduced the cash burden. So we're bringing a lot of the cash forward for these deals from traditional lending. We're signing up the personal guarantees. A uh, great example of this is we sold a, I mentioned the $11.5 million uh, senior care deal. It was an Alzheimer's facility that we sold to a REIT. We actually turnkeyed it, meaning we took down the financing. We actually had the thing stocked with toilet paper the day we sold it to them. They moved right in. So those that, and we brought on the investors to pay for the permits. So those are the types of things that we take a look at and the ways we stack the cash coming in. It's referred to as the capital stack. So we bring on the investors in the front end and then we bring in the lion's share of the cash needed under our own financing relationships and credit facilities. You guys are really uh, sophisticated. The average investor has never thought about, you just mentioned the, the word so many times in our first few minutes together, the permitting process. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that just from a standpoint of the complexity of it? I don't think the average guy, mm -hmm. I'm sure the average guy does have a clue, and you're in a, would it be fair to say, a restricted state in terms of growth? Yeah, relatively speaking, it is absolutely restricted, and it has an adverse impact uh, from an inventory standpoint to the everyday consumer. It has a great impact to us because the lower the inventory, the higher the price point. So when we are able to bring inventory to the table, it brings extra margin. Simply put, permitting is land use. So you drive by a field on some road and you're like, oh, we should put houses there. It's uh -huh. not as simple as that. When you look at that field, chances are you're not allowed to build anything there. You have to go to usually the town or the city that the land is in. 
and you have to request the permit. They have zoning law. You follow the zoning law and density calculations. So hypothetical 10 acre field, if it's quarter acre zoning, meaning you can have one house for every quarter acre, you have to actually go and request that. And you have to go through a process to secure the permits. Where the challenge is in our market, and again, I say it's a challenge, it has its positive impact, is at the state level, there's an additional permitting process. So you go through getting permits for stormwater, getting permits for impervious surface, recreational impact fees, wetland impact fees, prime agricultural impact fees. These are all the, the permits that you need to get either from the town or the state to make that field that looks like it you should have houses into it, yeah. into a field that you can put them in. And being able to have those laws, you now just created huge margins. To give you some perspective, and this doesn't necessarily apply to everybody's market, you'll hear me talk about local market conditions a lot, but in our market, if it's raw, I'm willing to pay, generally speaking, about 10000 per potential unit. So talking about that 10-acre parcel with quarter-acre zoning, theoretically, I could do 40 units. I'm willing to pay up to 400000 wow. When I'm in a situation, take? Take? it can take a year. It can take three years. We have a project right now where it's actually 200 units and change as well as uh, six commercial buildings. We're in year five of the town level permitting process. We still have to go through the state. We anticipate there's going to be another two years. It's going to be seven years to secure the permits. Now, I projected when we originally evaluated five years for those permits. And the return and performance numbers are incredibly favorable because of the delta. So to give you some perspective, I buy that land at $10,000 per lot. Yeah. I then spend 20000 per lot in permitting it, legal engineering and impact fees. I'm at 30000 in cost. Let's say hypothetically I have another 25000 in cost in allocated infrastructure, meaning roads and driveways and that type of stuff. Now I'm at 55000 in cost. That lot, because it's so difficult to bring to market and because of the supply and demand dynamics, I might be able to liquidate that lot for 125,000. I haven't even oh built a house on it. Oh my goodness! No. So there's how could anybody... huge uptick in margin. All right, now tell me about that part because obviously you're doing it for a reason. My my goodness, I, I don't think a builder could. Uh, how many people could survive in this market? Not very many. Twenty-five thousand dollars for it before you start building a house, really? No, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm oh dealing God. with uh, a client right now, just a regular single-family home built. Their budget is five hundred thousand. They want a 2,000 square foot colonial style house, hardwood floors, carpeting in the bedroom, granite countertops. It's nothing crazy, but it's a nice house. I'm having a difficult time getting them into that at 500,000. The lot that they have under contract is 160 grand. And that's the advantage and the challenge. So that one transaction is reflective of the difficulty. You really have a good attitude. You gotta have an attitude to to be in business and you have lined up all these costs and all these challenges, you call them. And there's not very many people that or companies that can survive under that, that much. Who has that much patience in the world today? I mean, nobody. That's part of the leadership and the mentality that comes down from Adam and the overall culture of the Adam Hergen Rother companies, which includes Keller Williams, a whole bunch of realtors, BlackRock Construction, his training organization, his groups that are in 22 different states. It's about the mentality. If it weren't difficult, everybody would do it. And if everybody did it, there wouldn't be money in it. Right. If it's easy, generally, the margins aren't great. If it's easy, it's usually not worthwhile doing. If it's easy, you're not going to be able to get the outcomes you're targeting. It's got to be tough to be able to get those margins. And frankly, he has put together a team, and it, admittedly, it's taken me time to get here. This is not an easy business. You're spot on. But it's the fact that we're able to deliver good margins for ourselves, deliver yeah. favorable yeah. returns for our investors, and ultimately bring community good. It's difficult that there's not inventory. It's important for the community to have inventory brought to market. So 
as taking, difficult yeah. as it is, we're doing really. important things. Yeah, you're taking advantage of a scarcity in the marketplace. You take, where does the mm -hmm. client come from? Where do you get the client? Where's the ultimate buyer of this house? Do they have to know ahead of time? Or is, where are the buyers gonna come for these properties? It depends on location. Um, so Vermont, if you're outside of Port Chittenden County, where we operate, so the Burlington area, Burlington, Vermont area, it yeah. becomes incredibly difficult to find those buyers. But in Chittenden County, and the, again, uh, underlying local market metrics, in yeah. Chittenden County, our home ownership vacancy rate covers at two and a half percent, which is well below national averages. So we have one and a half percent vacancy rate on residential rentals. Where are the buyers coming from? They're renting right now and desperate to get into the single family. And then we've also had a fair amount of condo and townhouse style inventory come into the market. That was a result of sort of 2007, 2008. Uh, we are also a bit of a younger demographic in our core county. So we have younger folks tend to live in that style. Now they're upgrading to that nicer single family home. The other demand point that we have is we're an old state. We're third or fourth oldest per capita in the nation. So if you have the families that had three kids, four or five bedrooms, whatever it was, they're downsizing into a, into sort of that 2,000 square foot, 450 to 550 price point, depending on finishes. That's where that demand is coming from, and it's critical. Let me interrupt you a sure. little bit, okay? Because I, I, I really want my listener to, uh, to capture what you're saying, because not only are you cre creating, you're creating a market with it, where everybody else is saying, oh, you can't do it here. That's the impression I'm getting. Uh, so you, you guys are the doers. That's good. What, what's a challenge for everybody else is just a little patience for you and a little calculating. So I love all that. What would, the, what would, what would a homeowner have to do? can't do it. Yeah. it uh, let me just, one little point here. To, it's not that they can't do it here. They're not willing to go through the difficulty. And that, that's what sets us apart. You, you, don't even, you don't even think about quarterly reports. You're thinking about five-year segments. 10 year segment. I, mean, I, get, I completely get it, but that, that's a philosophy that people don't pick up at until they're 60 years old. It's too late for them. They should have had that philosophy when they were 20. Yeah, they were 20, that'd yeah. be a whole different world. And so you'll let Absolutely. Be, I'm very complimentary of the whole thing. I, I love what you're talking about. Let me ask you just a couple Thanks. of real earthy yep. kind of questions, okay? So a mm -hmm. guy that uh, lives in Vermont, that lives in a, uh, I guess you, there's, a, there's probably not going to be a lot of $200,000 houses, but probably a lot of $400,000 houses because you're going to be above everybody else in, because of the cost. Mm -hmm. What would the taxes be? Do they have high, is it a high tax state in terms of, of the people that live in that yeah. property? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it, it, Vermont is really segregated. So we have poor Chittenden County and then everything else. Everything else is fairly rural and you'll find $80,000 trailers. You have to be an hour away from where all the jobs are. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> so are the farmers us, protected and have low tax? So how do you do that? The, the farmers are viewed very favorably at the state house. So there's a lot of subsidies and all sorts of stuff. When they're looking at environmental impacts, they usually yell at the developer and not the farmer. So it, it does create a bit, of a, a bit of a challenge. But the guy looking to live in Vermont, it, it, if he's looking to be in Corrigan County, yeah, he needs that four to five hundred thousand dollar price point, and he's competitive, or she is competitive, in a multiple offer situation. It, it, it's it's great for us as a developer. It's not actually so great for the consumer. Right? Yeah, I, I, I got that part. So the people there are willing to pay for that. So what? There's only a million of them anyway. At the, when, when, in your lifetime, there'll probably only be a million people in the whole state. But let me ask you just a couple more questions because I'll run out of time. It's really interesting. Uh, you guys have, uh, you, you and your team have a whole different perspective here. So how about yourself? What is your, your investment philosophy? Uh, does it follow pretty much what you've already talked about? Is that the kind of investment philosophy you live in? Or, 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 how do you feel yeah. about it? I'm risk averse and conservative. So my investment okay. philosophy is always data driven, right? The numbers will tell you. The, the joke I make with investors right now is I don't make decisions. Excel makes decisions. So, uh, it, oh my God! I don't believe you said that. Right? Excel makes it. <laughs> All right, slide that, that, Oh my God! You talk about opposite. Well, you and I are just about uh, two opposite guys. I, I love this. <laughs> Excel makes it. Well, oh, you made my day. Yeah.
<laughs> well, because yeah. ultimately you're really trying to figure out what the performance is. And that yeah. performance, that money, I'm, I'm it, it, when it boils down to it, we're looking to make money. I'm looking to make money. Our company is looking to make money. You're looking to make money. Your listeners are looking to make money. How do we go about making that money? And for us, it's a, and part of this has to do with the overall group that is Adam Hergen Rother Companies. He's got real estate teams in 22 different states. Those commissions are cash drivers for him. So our asset portfolio is to be that wealth driver. It's to build that net worth. That's the same philosophy that I apply. I had a conversation with Adam about some of my underlying compensation and the conversation wasn't actually, yeah, I want another $15,000 today. It's keep that 15 because I know 10 years, five years from now, it's 150, it's 300. Right. That's the mentality that I apply. I, I have a decent lifestyle. I enjoy my family. I got a pool at the house. We sit and we have margaritas on the weekends. I get out of my kayak on the lake on the weekends. I'm happy with my lifestyle. Yeah. Could I live a, a higher lifestyle if I chose a less long-term view of my investment approach? Absolutely. But I'd rather be able to retire, not retire, but pick and choose the work that I do at 50 than live the ultimate lifestyle and the big boat and vacations every month when I'm 38. Yeah. That's just the truth of it is every dollar I don't collect off of investments today is two dollars, three dollars, is four dollars, is ten dollars, whatever it may be down the road, and that is really what the investment strategy I take is. I want to be, live the biggest life possible down the road, so I'm willing to make the short-term investment decisions today that will result in long-term lifestyle upgrades. Let me see if I can capsulize it, and I like what you're talking about. It's unusual. And uh, that's why you're going to be successful at it. But capsulized, you basically said, what you guys do is build value. You build the value mm -hmm. into what you're doing. And that was through a god-awful permit possible process through the land development all the way to, to I think you re made reference, the toilet paper was in the building. <laughs> you guys really are building value. And... Uh, as you, as we finish, I've only got a couple of minutes. Talk to me a little bit about value and tell me how that how important that is to that company. It's obvious to me. The value proposition is absolutely critical, right? And for us, we don't make a penny unless we own a building and have somebody rent and move in, or sell a house, or or buy some permitted land. They're already perceiving that you've brought value. So, what's the value we're bringing to? ourselves, our investors, and our staff. And so that value is driven by a willingness to do the hard work. Right. It's driven by a understanding and a local market expertise. It's driven by a knowledge of how to structure these deals to get the po best possible return, to benefit the most from the upside, to mitigate the risk as much as possible. That is the value proposition we bring. So when I sit with an investor and their eyes gloss over as to what I'm discussing with them, I slow it down and I say, here's the value we're bringing. You don't need to understand the nuance and complexity. That's my job here. That's the value I'm bringing to you. And so that value mentality is critical to how we've been able to successfully grow our company. Cameron, I got to tell you, I'm impressed with the patience you guys have, and it would be difficult to say you weren't impressed with Adam and what he's done for such a young man and yourself too, because sounds like you're pretty young too. So, I want to thank you for what not, you've done not today. Not forty yet. Yeah, you're not forty yet. Good for you. I'm double the forty, so uh, <laughs> you got a long way to go. Just take care of your health on the way. That's all I can say. But anyway, uh, thank you for your time. As you close, tell everybody who you are and what you do and where you're going in the next five years, and you got thirty seconds max. All right, Ted, I really appreciate you having me on and the opportunity to speak to your folks. Again, I'm Kevin Whale. I'm the CFO of BlackRock Construction. We're a, a large growing construction management firm. We have 800 units in our pipeline, both in terms of liquidation from a residential standpoint, but also a retained asset. We're bringing value to our staff. We're bringing value to our investors, and we're having a good time while we do it.
you're going to be a, a, a multi-billion dollar company before you're done. I know you got big numbers in your head, so I'm sure you're on your That's way. That's what we're driving towards, Ted. I okay. really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, this is Linda. Don't forget, you can listen to more episodes at tedthomaspodcast.com. You can also listen to Imagine Wealth Without Risk on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. 